wicked, all these slave masters posing on your dollar. I wanted to do one of my first videos in a while on the rise of far-right extremism. I've been watching a lot of mini documentaries from PBS and Vice and reading some new studies about how it's becoming more widespread. I mean, you wouldn't really know since mainstream media isn't reporting about it. They've been focused mostly on COVID and the war in Ukraine. But the more and more I thought about it, I can't really talk about the rise of far-right extremism without the context of the COVID pandemic. See, in my opinion, the COVID pandemic was one of the catalysts for its continued rise. So I thought it would be best to start with my thoughts on what lessons we could take away from our response to COVID. And through that journey, the rise of far-right extremism might not be too much of a surprise. What is a pandemic? Ever since COVID-19 began infecting people in December of 2019, the world would never be the same. An outbreak of a novel coronavirus from China began to spread like wildfire. From that point, the world has been engulfed in this anxiety of the unknown that COVID brought. The last time we faced something of this caliber was back in 2009 with the H1N1 flu. The CDC estimates that 151,700 to 575,400 people worldwide died from H1N1 during the first year the virus circulated. It primarily affected children and young and middle-aged adults. On August 10th, 2010, WHO declared an end to the 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic. However, the virus continues to circulate as a seasonal flu virus and causes illness, hospitalization, and deaths worldwide every year. Before that, our last pandemic was the 1968 H3N2 flu pandemic. The estimated number of deaths was 1 million worldwide and about 100,000 in the United States. Most excess deaths were in people 65 years and older. The H3N2 virus continues to circulate worldwide as a seasonal influenza A virus. According to the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology, a pandemic is a global disease outbreak. It differs from an outbreak or epidemic because it affects a wider geographical area, often worldwide, infects a greater number of people than an epidemic, is often caused by a new virus or a strain of virus that is not circulated among people for a long time. Humans usually have little to no immunity against it. The virus spreads quickly from person to person worldwide causes much higher numbers of deaths than epidemics, and often creates social disruption, economic loss, and general hardship. In researching this point, I realized that there was a lot of information about the more recent H1N1, or the swine flu, pandemic, and that comparing the response of that pandemic to the COVID pandemic we find ourselves in would bring some much needed context. The events in both unfolded eerily similar, but have different outcomes. Why and what lessons can we take away from comparing the reaction to both of these pandemics? I'm sorry to inform you, but COVID won't be our last pandemic, and it may not be even our worst. It's imperative we build upon our past mistakes and improve upon our successes. However, as we dive into the H1N1 response, you'll see history repeating itself, and this time, the outcome isn't as good. The Swine Flu You know, I grew up during the swine flu pandemic. In 2009, I was 22 years old. However, I do not remember a lot about the political environment during this time. This is mainly because of two reasons. I wasn't concerned at all with politics, and I was deployed to Iraq. I didn't even read the news much and I was confined to a secret detainment facility. I basically watched movies all day, treated patients, and played spades on my time off with other military personnel. I basically had no idea of the seriousness of swine flu and how it affected people in the states. With that being said, let's take a look at the timeline of the swine flu pandemic. In 2009, the first case of H1N1 was detected in a 10-year-old boy in California. The virus was a unique combination of influenza virus genes never previously identified in either animals or people. Two days later, an 8-year-old boy, 130 
miles away, tested positive for the same virus with no known connection between the two. The CDC began an immediate investigation into the situation in coordination with state and local animal and health officials in California. The infection seemed to occur from people who had close contact with infected pigs, but at this time, human-to-human -human spread of swine influenzas was, were rarely documented and not known to have widespread outbreaks. Around this time, the CDC alerted international health organizations of their findings. April 21st, the CDC requested that all influenza viruses that could not be subtyped be sent directly to them. Within a day, three samples from the San Diego County and Imperial County, California hospitals arrived and would eventually be called the 2009 H1N1. Around this same time, the CDC began working on developing a virus that would be used to make a vaccine. The virus was eventually chosen to be sent off to the vaccine manufacturers just in case the U.S. government should decide a vaccine was necessary. April 22nd, the CDC activated its Emergency Operations Center to coordinate the response to this emerging public health threat. April 23rd, samples submitted by Texas revealed two additional cases of human infections with 2009 H1N1, transforming the investigation into a multi-state outbreak in response. At the same time, the CDC was testing 14 samples from Mexico, some of which had been collected from patients who were ill before the first two U.S. patients. Seven of these samples would be positive for the 2009 H1N1 virus. April 24th, the CDC uploaded complete gene sequences of the 2009 H1N1 virus to a publicly accessible international influenza database, which enabled scientists around the world to use the sequences for public health research and for comparison against influenza viruses collected everywhere. April 25th, under the rules of the international health regulations, the Director General of WHO declared the 2009 H1N1 outbreak a public health emergency of international concern, and recommended that countries intensify surveillance for unusual outbreaks of influenza-like illness and severe pneumonia. Also, New York City officials reported an investigation into a cluster of influenza-like illness in a high school, and CDC testing confirmed two cases of 2009 H1N1 influenza infection in Kansas, and another case in Ohio shortly after. April 26, the United States government determined that a public health emergency existed nationwide. CDC's strategic national stockpile began releasing 25% of the supplies in the stockpile that could be used to protect and treat influenza. This included 11 million regimens of antiviral drugs and personal protective equipment, including over 39 million respiratory protection devices, masks and respirators, gowns, gloves, and face shields to states. Allocations were based on each state's population. Around this time, the FDA also took action to expand the possible usage of antiviral drugs Oseltamivir. and Zanzamir by issuing emergency youth authorizations. These drugs were previously shown to combat this strain of influenza. The EUAs allowed for use of the products in a manner different from what they were FDA approved for. This included allowing for off-label use of Oseltamivir to treat children younger than one year of age and to help prevent influenza in children three months to one year of age and Oseltamivir and Zanamivir to treat patients who are symptomatic for more than two days before initiation of treatment or who had complicated illness requiring hospitalization. April 27th, CDC issued a travel health warning recommending that United States travelers postpone all non-essential travel to Mexico. As in past influenza season, CDC urged the public and especially those people at highest risk of influenza-related complications to protect themselves by taking antiviral drugs early in their illness when recommended by their doctor. CDC also advised that everyone take everyday preventative actions like covering costs, and sneezes and staying home from work and school when ill to help reduce the spread of illness. April 28th, less than two weeks after identification of the new pandemic virus, the real-time PCR test developed by the CDC was cleared for use by diagnostic laboratories by the FDA under an emergency use authorization. 
This test allowed laboratories to identify the H1N1 virus without having to send it to the CDC. By May 18, 2009, 40 states have been validated to conduct their own 2009 H1N1 testing, with eight states having multiple laboratories able to do their own testing. CDC alerted the public that the expansion in testing capacity would likely result in a jump in the number of the 2009 H1N1 cases, but that would actually present a more accurate picture of the true scope of the H1N1 influenza in the United States. April 29th, the World Health Organization raised the influenza pandemic alert from Phase 4 to Phase 5, signaling that a pandemic was imminent and requested that all countries immediately activate their pandemic preparedness plans and be on high alert for unusual outbreaks of influenza-like illness and severe pneumonia. The United States government was already implementing its pandemic response plan. The CDC continued to post and update guidance for states, clinicians, laboratories, schools, partners, and the public. As the outbreak spread, the CDC began receiving reports of school closures and implementation of community-level social distancing measures meant to slow the spread of the disease. School administrators and public health officials were following their pandemic plans and doing everything they could to slow the spread of the illness. May 5th peak school dismissal day in the spring phase of the pandemic. 980 schools were dismissed, affecting 607,778 students. May 6, the CDC distributed recommendations for the use of influenza antiviral medicines to provide guidance for clinicians in prescribing antiviral medicines for treatment and prevention of 2009 H1N1 influenza. The CDC recommended that testing and antiviral treatment be prioritized for people with severe respiratory illness and people at high risk of complications from seasonal influenza. This included children younger than 5 years old, pregnant women, people with chronic medical conditions, and people 65 years and older. June 11th, the WHO declared a pandemic based upon the spread of the virus in other parts of the world and not a reflection of any change in the 2009 H1N1 influenza virus or associated illnesses. By June 19th, all 50 states in the United States, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands had reported cases of the H1N1 infection. Early in July, three 2009 H1N1 influenza viruses that were resistant to one of the drugs were detected in three countries. Around the same time, the CDC noticed a correlation with obesity and hospitalization rates of people with H1N1. Also, the lack of significant changes in the virus indicated that the H1N1 vaccine being manufactured would closely match the current circulating H1N1 virus and likely provide people with good protection against the H1N1 influenza. In late August, the CDC began working with the commercial supply chain for certain influenza countermeasures to monitor national inventory levels of critical supplies, antivirals, and respiratory protective equipment on a weekly basis. The FDA and the maker of Tamiflu realized that supply was severely limited in October. This prompted the CDC to release information on how to compound oral suspension from Tamiflu capsules meant for adults and make mixtures suitable for children from adult dosages. The H1N1 Vaccine In response to the increased number of H1N1 infections, the United States government launched the National Influenza Vaccination Campaign in October. In preparation for the 2009 H1N1 Influenza Immunization Program, on July 22nd, the National Institutes of Health announced the start of a series of clinical trials to test pilot lots of two manufacturers' version of the 2009 H1N1 Influenza vaccine in healthy people, as well as people with underlying health conditions like asthma and HIV. Preliminary results from the clinical trials were announced publicly. On July 23, 2009, the FDA's Vaccines and Related Biological Advisory Committee indicated support of the FDA's proposed plan to license monovalent 2009 H1N1 vaccines via a strain change pathway, similar to how seasonal influenza vaccines are licensed. This meant for the 2009 H1N1 vaccine would be made in the same way using the same standards already in place for seasonal vaccines. It also allowed Lysenzer to proceed more quickly since it did not require 
immunity data or additional safety except for the live attenuated vaccine data for licensure. On July 29, 2009, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices met to make recommendations for the 2009 H1N1 vaccine. The ACIP recommended that as many people as possible should receive the vaccine as quickly as possible. The CDC convened three public engagement sessions in mid-August in 10 regions of the United States with the purpose of soliciting citizen input into vaccination planning. The public provided opinions to the CDC regarding how vaccines should be provided in the U.S., and the information that was collected helped to inform how the 2009 H1N1 vaccine was distributed after it was manufactured. Ultimately, it was decided that the vaccine should be distributed as soon as it was ready so that people could be protected against influenza as soon as possible, versus waiting to distribute vaccines in large quantities when prepared. By the end of August 2009, prototype vaccines to prevent 2009 H1N1 virus had been developed, but they were not yet licensed. Production of the enormous quantities of vaccine necessary to protect the entire U.S. population was underway. The CDC expanded its contract for the Childhood Vaccine for Children program in the United States to provide centralized distribution of the 2009 H1N1 vaccine. On September 15, 2009, the FDA announced its approval of four 2009 H1N1 influenza vaccines, and later, on November 16, announced its approval of a fifth vaccine to protect against the 2009 H1N1 flu. October 5th, first doses of the H1N1 vaccine given in the United States. October 24th, influenza activity reached its highest level in the reporting week ending October 24th, 2009, with 48 of the 50 states reported widespread activity. Late October, second wave of H1N1 flu activity peaked in the United States. November 23rd, no school closures throughout the United States, first time since 8-25-2009. In December of 2009, the CDC published in the MMWR preliminary safety results for the 2009 H1N1 vaccines from the first months of reports received through the United States Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, a national voluntary reporting surveillance system and data from the Vaccine Safety Data Link. Results indicated that the vast majority, 95% of adverse events reported to VAERS after the receipt of the 2009 H1N1 vaccine were not that serious, like soreness at the vaccine injection site. Of the 3,783 reports, 204, or just 5%, were reports that involved what would be coded as serious health events defined as life-threatening or resulting in death, major disability, abnormal conditions at birth, hospitalization, or extension of an existing hospitalization. The percentage of reports involving what would be considered serious health events was not substantially different between the 2009 H1N1 and seasonal influenza vaccines. August 11, 2010, the World Health Organization announces an end to the pandemic. CDC communication during the pandemic. The CDC response to the 2009 H1N1 pandemic was led by science and continually evolved to meet the nation's needs as events unfolded and as more information became available. However, a consistent underlying communication strategy underscored the entire CDC response. The strategy is based on the emergency risk communication principles of quickly, proactively, and transparently communicating accurate information to the public and to partners. This strategy included CDC clearly stating its goals and actions in response to the evolving situation and acknowledging what was not known as well as what was known. Another important part of the strategy was the CDC setting the expectation that information and advice would change rapidly as the situation evolved. From the earliest days of the pandemic, the CDC regularly articulated its goals to reduce transmission and illness severity and provide information to help healthcare providers, public health officials, and the public address the challenges posed by the new virus. Throughout the response, in an effort to provide the most information in the most effective ways possible, the CDC drew on existing knowledge but also worked with partners to conduct ongoing scientific research and evaluation of people's knowledge, 
attitudes, and practices related to a number of topics, including 2009 H1N1 flu, infection control guidance, and the vaccine. There was a concerted effort to get information out as soon as possible and to keep the public and partners aware of developments as they unfolded, even as guidance was changing quickly. For example, when relatively few cases of human infection with this virus were lab confirmed and the severity of the pandemic was not known, on April 28, 2009, the CDC posted guidance for schools and advised that they close if they had a suspected or actual case of the flu in order to lessen the risk of spreading the 2009 H1N1 into their communities. As more information became available, suggesting a lower risk of severe illness and death from the 2009 H1N1, six days later, the recommendation was changed to recommend against school closure for community mitigation purposes. Media Influence During the H1N1 Pandemic Undoubtedly, media is one of the biggest purveyors of information. According to a poll conducted by Gallup, Republicans, independents, and Democrats' trust in mass media during the late 1990s was relatively close. It hovered around 50% for all three. However, as time progressed, Republicans' trust went steadily down and then hit rock bottom during Trump's presidency, with the lowest being 10% in 2020. Independents have generally stayed around 40%. However, Democrats' trust during Trump's presidency went through the roof, hitting 76% at one time. During the time of the swine flu pandemic, the general public was hovering around 40%. So why does this matter? According to a paper titled Pandemic Stories, Rhetorical Motifs and Journalist Coverage of Biomedical Risks by Tess Laidlaw, it states, In the case of the 2009 H1N1 swine flu outbreak, Traditional media content was a significant source of information on the outbreak. Indeed, even physicians source information on the outbreak from the media, to the extent that, as a result of their study, many urged public health officials to become more cognizant of the importance of information reported by the media. The paper continues to express how important early messaging is before vaccines and cures by journalists. One of the biggest preventative measures is behavioral change, and according to the World Health Organization, this may be the only type of protection that is available. This paper has so much in it, but I want to use it later when I talk about how our response to the COVID pandemic derailed as it dragged on. But I do want to point out that the paper states the H1N1 outbreak was the first pandemic in which Web 2.0, or social media, began to constrain the ways in which public health authorities disseminated information. The model for communication from experts in the H1N1 pandemic was predominantly one way, perhaps the last pandemic when this will be so. Even with the burgeoning uptake of social media, found that audiences still prefer traditional media as a source of information during the H1N1 outbreak, even while public health organizations such as the CDC add social media to their outbreak communication strategies. To put simply, the H1N1 pandemic existed in a realm in which traditional media still played an important part in how Americans got their information. It was basically a one-way street, and this might have been one of the biggest factors as to why the pandemic didn't blow up more than it did. Americans generally trusted the experts and the information being relayed through mass media. I will go into more detail later on this subject since comparing it to the current COVID pandemic shows just how much we learned or forgot from our last pandemic. Hopefully what I've covered starts to draw some similarities to the COVID pandemic we are in now. These similarities are going to play a large role in discussing our response to both. The COVID-19 Pandemic Let's now shift our focus to the timeline of the COVID pandemic. With the context of the swine flu pandemic fresh in our minds, I hope that some of you will be able to see how our response was similar, but because of the political and social landscape, the results have been widely different. December 12, 2019 a cluster of patients in Wuhan, China began to experience shortness of breath and fever. December 31, 2019 The World Health Organization China Country Office is informed of a number of cases of pneumonia of unknown cause detected in Wuhan, all cases connected to a seafood wholesale market in the city. 
January 5, 2020. Chinese public health officials share the genetic sequence of the unknown pneumonia virus, Wuhan Hu-1, through an online database. January 7, 2020. Chinese authorities identify and isolate a novel coronavirus as the causative agent of the outbreak. The same day the CDC establishes a 2019 NCOV incident management structure to guide the response. January 13, 2020. The Thailand Ministry of Public Health confirms the first imported case of lab-confirmed novel coronavirus from China. January 17, 2020. The CDC began screening passengers on direct and connecting flights from Wuhan, China at major airports. It also deploys a team to Washington to assist in contact tracing efforts in the first reported case in America. January 20th, 2020. The CDC confirms the first U.S. laboratory-confirmed case of COVID-19 in the U.S. from samples taken on January 18th in Washington State. January 22nd, 2020. The World Health Organization International Health Regulation Emergency Committee meets and decides to monitor the situation and reconvene in 10 days to rediscuss. It also confirms human-to-human -human transmission. January 29, 2020, the White House establishes the Coronavirus Task Force. January 31, 2020, the Department of Health and Human Services declares the SARS-CoV-2 virus a public health emergency. New travel policies are announced. The same day, the World Health Organization reconvenes and declares the coronavirus outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. February 4, 2020 The United States Food and Drug Administration approves the Emergency Use Authorization Pact for the CDC-developed SARS-CoV-2 diagnostic test. February 11, 2020 Who announces the official name of the virus? COVID-19 February 23, 2020 Italy becomes the global hotspot for COVID and announces a lockdown of the entire country. February 26, 2020. The CDC's Dr. Nancy Messonnier, Incident Manager for the COVID-19 Response, holds a telebriefing and braces the U.S. for the eventual community spread of the novel coronavirus and states that the disruption to everyday life may be severe. February 29, 2020, the FDA announces new policies for certain laboratories that develop and begin to use validated COVID-19 diagnostics before the FDA has completed review of their emergency youth author authorization request. The CDC updates its criteria to guide evaluation and testing of patients under investigation for COVID-19. March 11, 2020, the World Health Organization declares COVID-19 a pandemic. March 13, 2020, President Donald J. Trump declares a nationwide emergency. March 14, 2020, the CDC issues a no-sail order to all cruise ships. The order calls for all cruise ships in the waters that the U.S. has jurisdiction over to cease activity. March 15, 2020, the United States begins to shut down to prevent the spread of COVID-19. New York City public school systems, the largest school system in the U.S., shuts down, while Ohio calls for restaurants and bars to close. March 17, 2020, the first human trial of a vaccine to protect against the pandemic COVID-19 begins in the United States at Kaiser Permanente Research Facility in Seattle, Washington. March 26, 2020, the United States Senate passes the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, or CARES Act, providing $2 trillion in aid to hospitals, small businesses, and state and local governments while including an elimination of the Medicare sequester from May to December 31, 2020. March 28, 2020. The United States Food and Drug Administration issues an emergency use authorization to allow hydroxychloroquine sulfate and chloroquine phosphate products donated to the strategic national stockpile to be distributed and used for certain hospitalized patients with COVID-19. April 3, 2020. At a White House press briefing, the CDC announces new mask wearing guidelines and recommends that all people wear a mask when outside of the home. The CDC also launches COVID View, a weekly report that summarizes and interprets key indicators from a number of existing surveillance systems. April 10th, 2020. The United States surpasses Italy as the global leader for reported deaths due to COVID-19, 23,036. April 13th, 2020. 
Most U.S. states report widespread cases of COVID-19. At a White House press briefing, President Trump announces that the U.S. will cease funding to the World Health Organization, shaking the public health community during the pandemic. April 24th, 2020. Georgia, Alaska, and Oklahoma begin to partially reopen their states despite concerns from health experts saying it was too early to reopen. April 26, 2020. Clinicians in the United Kingdom note increased reports of previously healthy children presenting with severe inflammatory syndrome. This condition would later be known as multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, an inflammatory condition that affects children with COVID-19. April 30th, 2020. President Trump launches Operation Warp Speed, an initiative to produce a vaccine for the coronavirus as quick as possible with the CDC as an integral member. May 1st, 2020, the United States Food and Drug Administration issues an emergency use authorization for the investigational antiviral drug remdesivir for the treatment of suspected or laboratory-confirmed COVID-19 in adults and children hospitalized with severe disease. The CDC launches the SARS-CoV-2 sequencing for public health emergency response, epidemiology, and surveillance, or SPHERES, a consortium to expand the use of whole genome sequencing of the COVID-19 virus. May 2nd, 2020. The World Health Organization renews its emergency declaration from three months prior, calling the pandemic a global health crisis. May 8th, 2020. News media outlets report that top White House officials shelve CDC guidance for implementing the Opening Up America Again framework that include detailed advice on how to safely reopen the country. May 9th, 2020. The U.S. unemployment rate at 14.7%, the worst rate since the Great Depression. With 20.5 million people out of work, hospitality, leisure, and healthcare industries taking the greatest hits. It is affecting low-income and minority workers the most. May 28th, 2020. The United States coronavirus death toll surpasses 100,000. June 8, 2020. The World Bank states that COVID-19 will plunge the global economy into the worst recession since World War II. June 24, 2020. Three weeks prior, Black Lives Matter protests broke out across the country due to the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Experts worried that this would lead to a spike in cases, but researchers released a report saying that it did not because the protests caused more people to stay home. The protest led to CDC rethinking its pandemic response to include a health equity framework. July 23rd, 2020. The CDC releases new science-based resources and tools for school administrators, teachers, parents, guardians, and caregivers for safe school reopening. September 22nd, 2020. The United States coronavirus death toll surpasses 200,000. October 2nd, 2020. President Trump tests positive for the coronavirus. October 5, 2020. The White House outbreak continues as several aides and the press secretary test positive for the virus. October 7, 2020. New Zealand declares itself virus free. November 1, 2020. The CDC announces the end of the no sale order for cruise ship companies. December 11, 2020. The FDA issues an emergency use authorization for the first COVID-19 vaccine, the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. December 14, 2020, Sandra Lindsay, a nurse in New York, becomes the first American outside a clinical trial to receive the COVID-19 vaccine as death tolls surpass 300,000. December 18, 2020, the United States Food and Drug Administration issues an emergency use authorization for the second COVID-19 vaccine, the Moderna vaccine. December 21st, 2020, the United States Congress passes the second COVID Relief Act, which will now go to President Trump for approval or veto. This act promises $600 per individual. December 24th, 2020, it is estimated that more than 1 million people in the U.S. are vaccinated against COVID-19. December 30th, 2020, the first U.S. case of the U.K. variant reported in the U.S. in Colorado. January 8, 2021, amid vaccine shortages at Pfizer and Moderna, both companies, along with scientists at the NIH, 
are looking at ways to double their supply to prevent future shortages as the death toll surpasses 400,000. January 25th, 2021. First U.S. case of Brazil variant of coronavirus reported in Minnesota. January 26, 2021. Worldwide COVID-19 cases surpass 100 million. January 28th, 2021. The first U.S. case of South African variant of coronavirus reported in South Carolina. February 16th, 2021. Vaccine distribution disrupted in several states including Texas, Missouri, Alabama, and New Hampshire due to severe winter storms. February 21st, 2021. The United States COVID-19 death toll surpasses 500,000. February 27th, 2021. The FDA approves emergency use authorization for Johnson & Johnson one-shot COVID vaccine. March 8th, 2021. The CDC announces that fully vaccinated people can gather indoor without masks. April 2nd, 2021. The CDC announces fully vaccinated individuals can travel safely domestically in the U.S. without a COVID test first. April 21st, 2021. United States surpasses 200 million vaccinations administered. June 1st, 2021. The Delta variant, first identified in India in late 2020, becomes the dominant variant in the United States. The variant kicks off a third wave of infections during the summer of 2021. July 27, 2021. After a substantial upswing in cases due to the Delta variant, the CDC releases updated guidance for everyone in areas with substantial or high transmission to wear a mask while indoors. August 6, 2021. The CDC study shows that among people previously infected with COVID-19, reinfection was less than half as likely among those who were vaccinated after their first infection. October 7, 2021. A CDC study published in Pediatrics reveals that more than 140,000 U.S. children under the age of 18 years lost a parent, custodial grandparent, or grandparent caregiver who provided the child's home and basic needs. October 29, 2021. New CDC studies provide further evidence that COVID-19 vaccines offer higher protection than previous COVID-19 infection. November 26, 2021. The World Health Organization classifies a new variant, Omicron, as a variant of concern after it was first reported by scientists in South Africa. The variant has several mutations in the spike protein that concern scientists around the world. This is the end of the current timeline produced by the CDC as of January 22, 2022. The CDC shows that the Omicron is now the most prevalent variant across the U.S. at 99.5% of total cases tracked. Also, according to the CDC, COVID deaths have reached 859,000 in the U.S. alone. Daily cases have been above 500,000 for almost the entire month of January. Today, it's May 17th, 2022. We've actually surpassed 1 million deaths. I know going through both these timelines was boring, and many of you might have not made it through the whole thing, but I honestly believe this context was needed to truly understand where we are. We needed to look at a recent case study and compare it to COVID, and while COVID is still fresh in many people's minds, I don't believe many of you actually remember the sequence of events for this pandemic. I really wanted to lay out some solid context for both events and build the proper base to move forward. How do these compare? I know that the current COVID pandemic is much worse than the swine flu pandemic ever was, but it is the most recent. Hopefully talking about these two will help us analyze our current political and social climate and allow for us to take these lessons and apply them to future pandemics. From the anti-vaxxers all the way down to government rhetoric, a lot of these things are not new issues, but let me address some criticisms you may already have up front. I know the swine flu was not nearly as deadly, with only about 18,500 lad confirmed deaths reported to the World Health Organization, and after studies varying the actual death count between 150,000 to 249,000. 
Even a paper from 2010 concluded that the risk of serious illness from H1N1 was no higher than that of the seasonal flu numbers. But some studies estimated that the real number of cases, including asymptomatic and mild cases, could be 700 million to 1.4 billion, or 11 to 21% of the global population of 6.8 billion at the time. The interesting thing about this variant is that it didn't disproportionately affect people over 60 years old and made previously healthy people develop pneumonia and acute respiratory distress syndrome. With that being said, the flu is highly contagious and how we prevent its transmission should be similar to COVID, another respiratory virus. As I researched the H1N1 pandemic, I sometimes forgot it wasn't the COVID-19 pandemic I was looking at. That's because a lot of the events surrounding the conversation about swine flu mirrored COVID. One of the biggest things that stood out was the concept of otherism that is so prevalent in right-wing media. Mexicans are an easy scapegoat. A tried and true rhetorical tactic of the right is to blame Mexicans. We have all heard how illegal immigrants are destroying our economies, taking our jobs, and now even being able to vote in local elections. I mean, listen to these left-wing politicians talk about Mexicans. Illegal aliens should be allowed to attend Texas public schools free, or do you think that their parents should pay for their education? Who are you addressing that to? I think you're first in this. Uh... He was looking right at you. <laughs> I said he was. <laughs> Look, I'd like to see something done about the illegal alien problem that would be so sensitive and so understanding about labor needs and human needs that that problem wouldn't come up. But today, if those people are here, uh, I would reluctantly say I think they would they would get whatever it is that they're you know what the society is giving to their neighbors. But it has the problem has to be solved. The problem has to be solved because with as we have kind of made illegal some kinds of labor that I'd like to see legal, we're doing two things. We're creating a whole society of really honorable, decent, family-loving people that are in violation of the law, and secondly, we're exacerbating relations with Mexico. The, cha the, the answer to your question is much more fundamental than whether they attend Houston schools, it seems to me. I don't want to see a whole, if they're living here, I don't want to see a whole, I think it's six and eight-year-old kids being made, you know, one totally uneducated and made to feel that they're living with outside the law, let's address ourselves to the fundamentals. These are good people, strong people. Part of my family is a Mexican. Can I, can I add to that? I think the time has come that the United States and our neighbors, particularly our neighbor to the South, should have a better understanding and a better relationship than we've ever had. And I think that we haven't been sensitive enough to our size and our power. They have a problem of 40 to 50 percent unemployment. Now, this cannot continue without the possibility arising with regard to that other country that we talked about, of Cuba and what it is stirring up, of the possibility of trouble below the border and we could have a very hostile and strange neighbor on our border. Rather than making them or talking about putting up a fence, why don't we work out some recognition of our mutual problems, make it possible for them to come here legally with a work permit, and then while they're working and earning here, they pay taxes here. And when they go on to go back, they can go back and they can cross and open the border both ways by understanding their problems. This is the only safety valve right now they have with that unemployment that probably keeps the lid from blowing off down there. And yeah. I think we could have a, friend, a fine relationship and it would solve the problem you mentioned also. Yes, I lied. That's actually the conservative godfather president, Reagan and President George Bush talking about Mexicans being good people and how we don't need to build a fence. However, this has become an easy tactic that fires up the Republican base, even though it'll never be solved. It's one of those fallback arguments that always gets the right wing riled up and scared. I mean, the concept of using others to promote fear and thus gain political power isn't new. Just watch the movie Birth of a Nation to see a lot of where these ideas started. I'm going to talk about the horrible, horrible story of illegal aliens bringing a deadly new flu strain into the United States of America. Make no mistake about it, illegal aliens are the carriers of the new strain of human swine avian flu from Mexico. 
Could our dear friends in the radical Islamic countries have concocted this virus and planted it in Mexico, knowing that you, Jeanette Napoletano, would do nothing to stop the flow of human traffic from Mexico? And are they a perfect mule? Perfect mules for bringing this virus into America. Yeah, that was an actual point from Michael Savage of the Savage Nation. In a post entitled, Hey, maybe we'll finally get serious about the borders now, Michelle Malkin, a conservative blogger and Fox News host, bragged, I've blogged for years about the spread of contagious diseases from around the world into the U.S. as a result of uncontrolled immigration. Neil Bortz, host of the nationally syndicated The Neil Bortz Show, was also on the case on his radio show. There's the bioterrorism angle. What better way to sneak a virus into this country than give it to Mexicans? You know, you, you want to get the epidemic into this country. Get it going real good and hot south of the border. And you know, just spread a rumor that there's construction jobs available somewhere and here it comes. The National Review Online's Mark Stein suggested that we rename the swine flu the undocumented flu. Glenn Beck said, if you are a family and you're down in Mexico and you're dying and those in America are not, why would you flood this border? Doesn't this sound familiar? Some important developments in our war against the Chinese virus. We'll be invoking the Defense Production Act just in case we need it. Why do you keep calling this the Chinese virus? There are reports of dozens of incidents of bias against Chinese Americans in this country. Your own aide, Secretary Azar, says he does not use this term. He says ethnicity does not cause the virus. Why do you keep using this? A lot of it comes say from it's China. racist. It's not racist at all, no, not at all. It comes from China. That's why. It comes from China. I and want to be accurate. About yeah, please, John. Please. You. Are you I have a great, I have great love uh, for all of the people from our country. But uh, as you know, China tried to say at one point, maybe they stopped now, that it was caused by American soldiers. That can't happen. It's not going to happen. Not as long as I'm president. Uh, it comes from China. John, please. Yeah, you can't make this up. They literally just recycle their same old xenophobic talking points. On February 11, 2020, the World Health Organization advised that media institutions refer to the novel coronavirus as COVID-19. Don't, they continued, attach locations or ethnicity to the disease. This is not a Wuhan virus, a Chinese virus, or an Asian virus. The official name for the disease was deliberately chosen to avoid stigmatization. But in March, prominent Republican officials, initially Mike Pompeo and Paul Gosar, and conservative media outlets began using stigmatizing language by associating the virus with China. On March 8th, there was a 650% increase in Twitter retweets using the term Chinese virus and related terms. On March 9th, there was an 800% increase in the use of these terms in news media articles. A paper titled After the China Virus Went Viral, Racially Charged Coronavirus Coverage and Trends in Bias Against Asian Americans states that theories of media effects suggest that the use of stigmatizing terms such as the Chinese virus could negatively influence public attitudes about Asian Americans. Media effects are defined as changes in cognitions, emotions, attitudes, and behavior that result from media use. Research indicates that consuming media that depicts stigmatized groups in a stereotypical or threatening manner can increase racial bias. One pernicious stereotype is that Asian Americans are perpetual foreigners who are not truly American. Research suggests media can influence adoption of the stereotype at the subconscious level. Harboring these implicit beliefs in turn, may encourage discriminatory acts against Asian Americans, for example, in hiring. This point came up in many papers about the framing of the swine flu and that in the future, we needed to avoid these types of conversations. The conclusion of the paper basically states that after March 8th, a myriad of organizations criticized conservative media entities for using Chinese virus and related terminology 
warning that this stigmatizing language could increase bias towards Asian Americans. This evidence suggests it did, meaning that words actually do have an impact on how we behave and view our environment. But this is a tried and true rhetorical tactic of the right. It works every time. They frame these issues as a virus attacking a healthy cell, except in the case above, it's an actual virus causing actual harm to the community. To further contextualize this, according to the FBI's 2020 hate crime statistics, anti-Asian single bias incidences increased 57% in one year, from 158 in 2019 to 279 in 2020. According to the data published by the Centers for the Study of Hate and Extremism, anti-Asian hate crime incidents were on a steady decline till about 2016 and have been on a slight increase ever since. What's interesting is that the rhetoric of the swine flu didn't really see an increase of hate crimes against people of Mexican origin. What throws this off is that when you look at the FBI's data from 2007 to 2011, this category always makes up over 50% of the hate crimes reported. Basically, reported hate crimes against people of Mexi Mexican ethnicity is just the norm in America. The pandemics become political tools. Imagine politicians and political elements using pandemics to find a way to attack the other party, whether it's warranted or not. They attach rhetoric to things not necessarily related to help pass their broader policy positions. As with the previous topic about anti-Mexican sentiments, the pandemics become ways to try and push border policy under the guise of protecting our citizens from disease. No, not them stealing our jobs, but them bringing diseases over. So therefore, we must close the border to keep our citizens from being infected with whatever immigrants are bringing over. Notice this simple equation for most of the right's rhetoric. Immigrants are causing X. The right wing somehow finds a way to paint every problem America faces by replacing the X with it. Poor economy? Immigrants are causing our economy to suffer. Demographic changes? Immigrants are causing our culture to erode. Left-wing ideas such as social safety nets are becoming popular? Well, immigrants are bringing over the ideas that they're fleeing from. The list goes on and on. I mean, just think about the phrase, don't California or Texas. Don't bring your socialist left-wing collectivism taxation-minded ideas to Texas because that's why you're leaving California. The right loves to view problems through an us versus them approach. Usually, it is centered around the culture debate, but honestly, when they say culture, it is just a racially coded term for whiteness at this point. This allows their prejudice and sometimes just actual racism to hide behind ambiguous talking points. They'll say things like, I'm not racist, but I want closed borders. The question here is to keep out whom. I don't hate the poor, but I don't want to drive by them on my way home from work. Homelessness and the poor are usually associated with minorities. I don't have a problem with black people, but they shouldn't be in this area, meaning this area has a certain type it was constructed for, and it's not them. I'm not against welfare for those that actually want to work, the old trope of black people being lazy or welfare queens. I'm not against criminal justice reform, but they deserve to do the time if they do the crime. It's the same old song and dance. A lot of these same talking points are also used when talking about Democrats or left-wing ideologies like socialism and communism, but I don't want to get into that now. One of the tactics we see over and over again is to blame the other party for the current problems we face. While the majority of these problems are extremely complex, it's just easier to blame your political opponents as either a power grab or to continue holding power. For example, during the swine flu pandemic, the leader of the California Coalition for Immigration Reform wrote in an email, As many Christians have spoken, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Wouldn't it be even more interesting if some of these anti-American pro-illegal alien amnesty traitors posing as elected officials who just visited Mexico also contracted the disease and shared it with their loved ones? We wonder if they would still vote for open borders. From this one statement, you can see the same old talking points, using language that invokes religion, Christianity to be more specific, 
painting anyone who doesn't agree with them as anti-American traitors. This appeal to national fervor. This concept of open borders, which no democratic politician I know has ever suggested having open borders. They are tying the spread of the virus to actual political policies that the other side either supports or they create a straw man of those positions for their supporters. I mean, look at the current COVID pandemic. The right wing has exclusively been using the term China or Wuhan virus for quite some time. Trump used the expression Chinese virus more than 20 times between March 16th and March 30th. The deliberateness of the wording was made clear when a photographer captured the script of his speech wherein Trump had crossed out the word Corona and replaced it with Chinese. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo accused China of putting the world at risk for its lack of transparency, even scrapping a joint G7 statement after its members refused to refer to the virus as the Wuhan virus. In a series of tweets on March 12th, Michael Caputo, a former spokesperson for DHS, responded to a baseless conspiracy theory that the United States brought the coronavirus to Wuhan, China, by tweeting that millions of Chinese suck the blood out of rabid bats as an appetizer and eat the ass out of anteaters. So why is this a talking point for the right wing? Well, it helps the right push their core policies. In this case, it's their love of capitalism a continuation of the Red Scare. The right understands that a lot of people are not as fervently against communism as they historically were. They understand that communism isn't the political system that's going to bring the devil knocking to your door. If you can't argue the actual theories, then you have to find a way to counter them. The right knows that attaching these concepts to physical objects helps them communicate who is bad and who is good. China is the antithesis of America in their eyes. It's the communist regime that's going to take over and force you to participate in a social credit system and take away your freedom to choose between shitty beer in a red can and shitty beer in a blue can. Going back to the paper, after the China virus went viral, racially charged coronavirus coverage and trends and bias against Asian Americans, the researchers found that among non-Asians, implicit Americanist bias or the belief that Asian Americans are more foreign and less American compared to European Americans fell steadily from 2007 to early 2020. However, in our models, implicit Americanist bias began to increase for all non-Asians and for whites specifically on March 8th, with stronger trend reversals observed among individuals who identified as more conservative. To put these results in perspective, we estimate that the, in the approximately three week period from March 8th to March 31st, not only did aggregate levels of implicit Americanist bias among non-Asians grow after 13 years of fairly steady decline, it also grew enough to offset more than three years of prior declines. In short, rhetoric actually matters. During this whole time, many political and health leaders asked others to refrain from framing the virus in this kind of lens. And for some reason, the majority of right-wing pundits did the exact opposite. They ignored their requests and continued to do so, which led to some Americans being targeted just because of their ethnicity. It's like, if one party suggests us something, then the other party has to do the exact opposite, no matter what and no matter the consequence. Like a parent and a defiant child, or placing a big red button with a note that says do not push. However, I also noticed more populist rhetoric being used in these same spaces, framing everything against the elites or government scientists. In these circles, you have a lot of people saying fuck Fauci and also praising the few doctors that went against the vast majority of medical consensus. Remember this lady? It's what we call astra sex. That means this person is not really a demon or nephilim. It's just a human being that's a witch. And they astra project and sleep with people. I came here to Washington DC to tell America Nobody needs to get sick. This virus has a cure. It is called hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and zitromax. I know you people want to talk about masks. Hello? You don't need masks. There is a cure. I know they don't want to open schools. No, you don't need to, people to be locked down. There is prevention and there is a cure. We had a lady right here. She was sitting right there. 
she had been fantasizing about one of the movie stars. When she came to deliverance ground, during prayer, she started screaming. Her stomach was full. She was pregnant. She started screaming. She was tearing off her clothes. She was screaming and screaming like she was in labor. And she said, this thing came out of me. Her stomach deflated. Right here. Real life. (laughs) The good and bad of populism. The party of let's not make this pandemic political has been using political rhetoric since the start. From framing our criticism to how Trump has handled the pandemic as we're just still mad that he won, to public health policies aimed at the objective of the overall health of the population as trying to usher in socialism and communism. I mean, just looking at the way current anti-vaxxers are trying to compare themselves to segregation in the 60s or to Jews in the Holocaust is a sort of new low in political rhetoric. Not only is their persecution complex on full display here, but their comparisons downplay real systemic structures of white supremacy and the inhuman use of government power to erase an entire subset of people through violence. These anti-vaxxers, vaccine skeptics, and people for body autonomy are still being given a choice. The Jews in Nazi Germany couldn't just give up their Jewish identity to be accepted into the German citizenry. This isn't the same choice as get the vaccine to participate in certain areas of the public. In reality, they can still live their lives, they just don't have the privilege to everyone and everything. Or the fact that no one is mandating through law that separate institutions, water fountains, and bathrooms of equal value be made for them. No one is denying their personhood or creating structures of hierarchy because of the way they were born. One of the biggest reasons why Trump lost his re-election was his handling of the pandemic. In fact, his administration had access to a 27-page autopsy report that outlined in 10 red states that the pandemic was one of their top voting issues. Had it not been for COVID, Trump probably would have won re-election hands down. If you count the illegal votes, they can try to steal the election from us. If you count the votes that came in late, we're looking at them very strongly. Instead of Trump admitting this error, his administration pushed the big lie. That Trump actually won when you only counted the legitimate votes. Their strategy here was to paint Democrats as the bad guys since they were the ones that pushed for the illegitimate votes that caused Trump to lose. Yes, they somehow found a way to demonize making voting easier for the average citizen. That the real reason Democrats wanted voter equity was so that they could cheat or stuff the ballot box. This has actually been a political tactic of the right since the rise of the KKK. In the movie Birth of a Nation, it showed that when black people were finally freed, they used their power to stop white people from voting and to stuff the boxes so that they could win. But in this case, the Democratic Party is proxy for black people at this point. Trump's failure during the pandemic was a huge talking point for the left, and it worked. Trump wasn't re-elected, and many people thought a return to having someone that respected health policy experts would end the pandemic. They thought that having a real response would save American lives. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out that way. The damage from Trump's mishandling of the situation left deep seeds of division and mistrust in experts and government institutions. The people we needed to cooperate the most thought it was all going to magically become a non-issue after Biden won. That Biden's election would somehow prove this democratic conspiracy that made COVID a bigger threat than it really was because it was an election year. But that didn't happen. It got worse when Delta and Omicron hit. Even with the effective vaccines and finally competent people at the helm, the pandemic would continue to ravage our nation. It's hard to combat a virus when half the nation won't even wear a mask in public spaces. The mask became a symbol of tyranny and fear instead of a way to protect your neighbors. The vaccine became a symbol of government conspiracy and body autonomy instead of a tool to help our stressed healthcare system. The nation's leading virus expert became a symbol of distrust and elitism. 
What's interesting though is in the paper how populism and conservative media fuel conspiracy beliefs about COVID-19 and what it means for COVID-19 behaviors, authors Dominic A. Stecula and Mark Pickup found that conservative media consumption tends to be a stronger predictor of conspiracy belief among those high in populism than among those low in populism. We also show that these beliefs have consequences. Those who believe the conspiracy theories about COVID-19 are less likely to adapt behaviors recommended by public health officials. They point out that populism just doesn't affect the right either. A lot of anti-vaxxers are on the left, and during the Democratic primaries, Bernie was a populist candidate. How so? Populism is a worldview that pits average citizens, the people, against the elites who are viewed as corrupt and morally inferior in a conflict that is both political and economic. This ordinary people versus the corrupt elite is the ideational definition of populism, but find that populism today in the US contains a second distrust of experts dimension. The paper further states that populism is a thin-centered ideology, meaning that it attaches itself to other ideological elements because on its own, Populism does not offer comprehensive answers to all political questions. This does not mean that populism is without meaning. Populism is clear on the fact that politics is a clash between the elite and the non-elite and conveys a clear distrust of experts, intellectuals, and existing forms of representation. But it leaves unanswered questions such as how institutions in the political, cultural, and economic realm relate to each other. As a result, populism is in practice combined with other, typically more complex ideologies and can thrive on both ideological right and left. In the United States, populism has historically been associated with the egalitarian left-wing politics, as exemplified by the progressive movement at the turn of the 20th century, but has more recently become associated with the political right. What's disturbing about the findings in this paper is evidence of what I talked about earlier with attaching race, nationality, or the place a virus was found as a means of defining it. Nearly half of all Americans, 48%, either somewhat or strongly agree that COVID-19 is a Chinese bioweapon. Hence, we see how red scare tactics attach to almost anything to validate one's own bias. The paper concludes with three prescriptions about COVID-19. The first being, we suggest that top-down messaging from those perceived to be from among the elite or the expert community is unlikely to work. Populist rhetoric primes anti-intellectual sentiment and makes messages from health experts unlikely to stick. Instead, bottom-up messaging from fellow populists might. Although a sizable majority of Americans trust experts and listen to their advice, there exists a proportion of Americans who are weary of their prescriptions. And to reach these people, different messengers are needed, people whom they know and trust. This is why so many people were once concerned about Trump's messaging on COVID. His words had real impacts on the lives of millions. Second, their findings imply that corrections to misinformation and conspiracy theories might not work for those with populist attitudes. There has been a major increase in fact-checking journalism in recent years, and that trend has potentially only increased during the pandemic, when an unprecedentedly large proportion of the population has tuned into the news. Unfortunately, corrections about COVID-19 conspiracies and misinformation coming primarily from experts might backfire among those high in populist attitudes. The rejection of conspiracies by elites might cause populists to believe more strongly in the conspiracies. Finally, their findings highlight that messages and appeals designed to combat conspiracy theories need to be targeted to both sides of the left-right political spectrum. The underlying assumption of many commentators is that these COVID-19 conspiracy theories are driven by Americans on the far right. We show that it is also driven by populists independent of ideology or partisanship. All in all, it seems that in both pandemics, the biggest factor to influence public health wasn't necessarily political parties in of themselves. It was the overall trust of experts, the type of media individuals consumed, and their overall perception of government. These things are what fueled the fire of misinformation and politicians found a way to weaponize it against their opposition. 
it seems the GOP, conservatives more generally, have a long-term goal to produce so much distrust in government institutions that we either end up destroying each other or we end up voting to gut their regulatory functions. But these ideas are being slowly planted through specific media sources. As these sources continue to carve out market share for themselves, they inevitably hurt the underlying fabric of this nation, its ability to use its institutions to protect its citizens. It's the economy, stupid. So not only do you hear the right harp about the economy during election season, like when it's under Democrats and reversing the bullshit of the Republican administration before, but they also bring it up during pandemics. However, the economic implications are a lot different since mandatory lockdowns were not imposed during the swine flu. It seems that economic rhetoric always finds a way to surface. A huge talking point during the swine flu was that President Obama said, Americans who may be sick should avoid airplanes and any system of public transportation where you're confined. And then Vice President Biden followed up with, I would tell members of my family, and I have, I wouldn't go anywhere in confined places now. It's not that it's going to Mexico in a confined aircraft where one person sneezes that goes all the way through the aircraft, but that's just me. Biden's remarks drew a lot of criticism from the travel industry. Americans should heed the advice of medical experts when determining how to best manage health concerns during an ongoing swine flu outbreak. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and countless other experts, swine flu should not discourage people from traveling to or within the United States. Roger Dow, President and Chief Executive of the U.S. Travel Association, said in the statement, Elected officials must strike a delicate balance of accurately and adequately informing citizens of health concerns without unduly discouraging travel and other important economic activity, he continued. American Airlines issued an even stronger statement. To suggest that people not fly at this stage of things is a broad brush stroke bordering on fear-mongering, American Airlines spokesman Tim Smith said. The facts of the situation, at this stage anyway, certainly don't support that. Biden's spokeswoman, Elizabeth Alexander, released a statement shortly after the vice president's remarks, saying, the advice he is giving family members is the same advice the administration is giving to all Americans, that they should avoid unnecessary air travel to and from Mexico. If they are sick, they should avoid airplanes and other confined public spaces such as subways. This is the advice the vice president has given family members who are traveling by commercial airline this week. In a paper on the CDC's website titled The Economic Impact of Pandemic Influenza in the United States, Priorities for Intervention, the authors conclude, Our results illustrate that the greatest economic cost is due to death. Therefore, all other things being equal, the largest economic returns will come from the interventions that prevents the largest number of deaths. A limitation of the model is that, Beyond the value of a lost day of work, the model does not include any valuation for disruptions in commerce and society. For example, if many long-distance truck drivers were unavailable to drive for one to two weeks, there might be disruptions in the distribution of perishable items, especially food. These multiplier effects are not accounted for in this model, mainly because an estimate of an appropriate multiplier will depend on who becomes ill, how many become ill, when they become ill, and for how long they are ill. While not much economic interruptions happen, these conclusions will become more important when we talk about COVID. Even the perception of a huge outbreak began to hurt global economies during the swine flu pandemic. China, Russia, and South Korea have banned imports of some North American pork, despite assurances that the flu is not spread through meat. Mexico City basically shut down, causing them to lose about $57 million a day. Royal Caribbean cruises suspended stops at Mexican ports indefinitely, and Carnival Cruise Lines canceled Mexico port calls. During this time, Obama's American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 was being debated. It was developed in response to the Great Recession, with the primary objective of this federal statute to save existing jobs and create new ones as soon as possible. Other objectives were to provide temporary relief programs for those most affected by the recession and invest in infrastructure, education, health, and renewable energy. 
flu pandemic funding was offered by Appropriations Chairman David Obey of Wisconsin to the beat of $870 million. This line item was cut from the Senate version in order to appease the three Republicans who supported the stimulus bill. Senator Susan Collins of Maine blocked the money because she deemed it an unnecessary expenditure for the economic recovery plan. It is the regular appropriations process that is the appropriate vehicle for considering funding for many of these programs that, while worthwhile, do not boost our economy, she said on February 9th. It does not make sense to include $870 million for the pandemic flu preparedness, again, an issue that I care deeply about because of my role on Homeland Security Committee. Note that not one Republican voted for this bill in the House, and only three in the Senate. COVID's impact on the economy would be a lot worse. Granted, our response to COVID was more severe than that of the swine flu. COVID spread fast, and the death rates began to rise during the first wave. Most of the country shut down around March of 2020. A lot of jobs shifted towards a virtual at-home model, including mine. Only essential businesses remain open during that time. A study from the Brookings Institute titled 10 Facts About COVID-19 in the U.S. Economy states, While voluntary social distancing and lockdowns that took effect in March of 2020 worked initially to isolate and drive down infections, those actions precipitated a severe economic downturn. The demand shock resulting from quarantine, unemployment, and business closures dealt a blow to consumer services. Lockdown measures and social distancing reduced the economy's capacity to produce goods and services. It is here we face one of the toughest questions of how government should react to pandemics of this nature. How do you balance the policies enacted to combat the virus with the overall health of the economy? At what point do we say human life is more important than an entire economic system? This was one of the greatest moral questions that I got to see play out in real time. And it turned out to be pretty much what I expected from each party. Republicans would put the economy over the health of the collective and Democrats wanted to deter the loss of life no matter the economic cost. During this time, GDP, Clothing stores, furniture and appliance stores, food services and drinking places, sporting and hobby stores, and gasoline stations got hit the hardest, while other industries like grocery stores, pharmacies, and non-store retailers grew exponentially. The nation's industrial sector took a huge hit, a sector that employs about 13 million people, with jobs that can't be done remotely. Small businesses took the brunt of this downturn, though. Compared to January 2020, average daily revenue as of August 9th was down by 47.5% in the leisure and hospitality sector, 16.4% in the education and health services sector, and 14.1% in the retail and transportation sector. Aggregate small business revenue across all industries had fallen by 19.1%. Small businesses are the backbone of the American economy and couldn't innovate fast enough to meet changing guidelines for reopening. Even after some states reopened, small businesses couldn't find employment. This may have been where the fuel for the Great Resignation came the following year. Many people were getting stimulus money to stay home and pay their bills. It is around this time period that the United States was using the government to pay people to stay home. It was protecting its most vital part, its labor force. And just when we thought we were going to be over with COVID, the Delta variant spread through the United States. Right when businesses and states began to loosen restrictions, the Delta variant exploded. Because of how contagious this variant was, even vaccinated people were advised to wear masks once again indoors. While the country was a little more experienced in how to handle COVID, many of the same policies enacted before were now being challenged by the right and few scientists. This led to many states and municipalities to not enforce any guidelines at all and leave it up to the individual to decide. A combination of these reactions in densely populated cities, not enough testing, and poor return to work policies caused the Delta variant to strangle the economy. One thing I want to point out, though, is an interesting data point I found while looking at the unemployment statistics. Look at the civilian unemployment rate seasonally adjusted when broken down into race and ethnicity. In 2008, white people suffered a pretty big spike during the recession as compared to Asian, Black, and Hispanics. Similarly, in the first quarter of 2022, another huge spike happened again. All groups felt this spike, but white people especially did. 
This might be because there are more white people as a percentage than other groups, so their spikes might be larger just because they have more members in their groups. When you look at the unemployment rates of people 25 and older with education, it seems those who had the most education didn't suffer as much as those with the high school diploma or some college. It seems that job losers were completed temporary jobs or lost them temporarily made up the bulk. Job leavers have been steady for years. Job leavers are defined as somebody who leaves their current job for a better opportunity or just quits outright. From this line here, it doesn't show any great resignation that I've been hearing about, but we'll dig into this more in a minute. Next, let's look at employment change by industry. The vast amount over the past year, starting January 2022, has been in the service providing industry and leisure and hospitality. What is a service providing industry? Well, it includes the trade, transportation, financial, education, and professional and business sectors. Why do these charts matter? Well, the COVID restrictions have hit sectors that are heavily dominated by white people, men to be more specific. Guess which demographic attacked the Capitol on January 6? Guess what demographic supports Trump? Guess what demographic has had more radicalized with conspiracies with QAnon and white supremacist groups? There seems to be a trend in which, when the economy starts to do bad, it mainly affects a certain group of people more. This group then uses their economic loss and power as political fuel and brings it to the polls. This time, it's hidden behind the concept of COVID and vaccines. COVID has hit their economic situations the hardest, and they blame pandemic controls put in place by Democrats for it. They don't care how many lives were possibly saved because of these measures. They just feel the individual hardships, and that's all that matters to them. Phrases like, if you're scared, stay home, dominated the rights rhetoric for months. What's interesting to me is that these people can't fathom living without working 40 hours a week. I understand people have to pay bills, and measuring risk is all a part of everyday life. But when the entire country is facing this problem, we can use the government to help alleviate the majority of those concerns so that we can focus on the health and safety of our labor force. Even now, with the COVID pandemic not being as bad, you can see the right focus on economic rhetoric as they gear up for midterm elections. If they're not talking about the historically high inflation, then it's the price of gas, the stock market crashing, or the baby formula shortage. Besides these things not even being in control of Biden's administration, it sends a simple message to voters. Democrats caused all these things you're experiencing now. Elect us and we will reverse it. Problem here is that these things were actually influenced heavily by the previous administration, or they're just outside of the control of the US government. They also hand wave away things like historically low unemployment and how wage and benefit packages have increased more than Trump's entire four years under Biden's first year. To put it simply, the economy always wins over voters, even if it's not actually a problem. The lessons we learned from the swine flu pandemic could have prevented so much death if implemented the same way during COVID. But because of the way politics has now crept into every facet of our lives, thousands more people needlessly died in order to make sure somebody got elected or to own the libs and their science. We live in an environment where populist rhetoric has infected even our most basic public institutions. That all our public servants are just elitists that want to see some common person suffer in poverty. Things that actually prevent the spread of COVID turn into political theater. Masks were no longer seen as tools to protect yourself and your neighbor, but as mouth muzzles or face diapers. Vaccines had become another conversation about the idea of freedom and gave the pseudoscience crowd more legitimacy. God was used to promote non-vaccination because Jesus didn't need vaccines. What was a vaccine going to do against government tyranny? A vaccine can't help you when you're being crucified for just doing your own research. Means to combat misinformation about COVID to save lives was also seen as anti-free speech and the government trying to silence its opposition so that it could usher in another holocaust, but this time against conservatives. Every tactic we had to help us control and prevent the spread of COVID failed to gain obedience from half the nation. That half our nation's citizens don't really care about the collective more than their own individual interests. 
they will seek information to confirm their own bias no matter the actual cost of holding those beliefs. Not to mention their actions resulted in hurting others. By getting infected with COVID or helping to transmit it by not following recommendations from public health experts, they overwhelmed our healthcare system. It caused countless suicides in the healthcare profession and many to leave the healthcare industry altogether. We lost so much institutional knowledge through the deaths of our healthcare providers that it's irreplaceable. And even worse, others that didn't have COVID couldn't get the healthcare they needed because of the problems presented by COVID. COVID not only brought to light the selfishness of so many of our citizens, but the inadequacy of our healthcare system when it faces unprecedented demand. Something so many touted would never happen under a capitalist framework. That ration care or being denied care straight up was something that only happened in universal healthcare systems. Turns out our system just remains open to those that can pay the piper. Meaning the rich will still get healthcare because they can afford the extra costs associated with getting that care no matter the situation. The poor are just left to their own demise. Our current brush with COVID should have us all worried about our future. COVID won't be the last pandemic and it certainly won't be the worst. Our system barely functioned underneath this mild test. We need to implement broad changes if we're going to survive anything close to COVID again. Our economy and healthcare system can't take much more before it collapses on itself. We need to start planning now. The rich won't care because they have money to just leave, like in the movie Don't Look Up. They won't face the consequences of being underprepared. They think they're above them, but us on the bottom, we don't have that choice. We need our public institutions to work for us. We need our media to give us the best and quickest information as possible. We need our government to act in the best interest of its citizens' health and not the business class's purse. We need our government to be of the people and for the people once again. One of the biggest problems is that under capitalism, there are different paths depending on how much money you have. One is shielding from having to plan for certain things because they can just buy their way out of it. So government institutions are not valuable to them but more of an extra step to their own wants and needs. They don't need universal health care because they have access to the best health care already. They can live wherever they want and not be restricted by time because they can just hire somebody to do it for them. They can take a private flight on their own schedule. They have someone to drive them so that they can still work without needing to focus on the road. They don't need public institutions because they can afford the best services whenever they want. They don't need to use the power of the collective to spread the cost down because they can already afford the cost outright with no problems. This divide erodes the power of our government institutions. The people with money can buy a voice in legislation or promote rhetoric on media sources, while everyone else is just happy to even have access to the services provided without having to sell a liver. Those that actually use the institutions have the smallest voice when it comes to how big those institution budgets are and what services they provide. Austerity measures hurt those who need the services the most. During COVID, we see that even the lower class parroting rhetoric that would actually hurt their own lot. The trust in our institutions like public health was severely damaged, but not due to some government malice, but outside actors taking things out of context and spreading rhetoric to create a problem that was never there. Then the solution to that problem would be getting rid of some government institution to allow the upper class to make more profits at whatever cost they can. We need to start talking about the positive of our government institutions more than complaining about them. We've gotten so used to their services, we don't know what it would be like not to have them. Having an entire agency dedicated to make sure companies or individuals don't pollute an area into non-sustainability is incredible. Having clean drinking water when you turn on your tap. Having electricity in rural areas. If it wasn't for the government, the electrification of the rural south would have never happened. Driving around knowing that others have insurance that will cover the cost of accidents in the event of an automobile collision. Someone that checks the operability of elevators, planes, trucking equipment, and infrastructure. 
Imagine having to pay for all that out of your pocket directly instead of the pennies and taxes you pay for those things now. How about we start being grateful for the things the government helps provide us instead of bitching about being at the DMV for 30 minutes past your appointment time? That's all I'm saying. If there was one big takeaway from the research I did while writing the script, it's that a lot of people talk about needing to know history so we don't repeat the same mistake in the past. The swine flu didn't happen that long ago, and to be fair, we didn't repeat any of the same mistakes, we just made new ones even though we did it right the first time. I wish I could be hopeful about the next public health threat we will face, but honestly, I'm not. Because of politics, I think we are one smallpox epidemic away from complete civil war, or one flu epidemic from a Mad Max future. I have very little faith in my citizens, and even less faith with those on the other side of the political spectrum. However, I am still hopeful that we can change, that we can figure out a way to be prepared for the next threat we will all face, and we will face it together. Thanks for sticking around and listening to the end. Uh, if you like the video, please like, share, and subscribe, and please let me know what you think in the comments below. This has been an extremely tedious script, and it's taken me like half a year to finish because of other things going on in my life. But it's important that we have something like this to look back and some way of of seeing how COVID played out during that time through somebody's voice that actually lived through it. Anyways, thanks guys. Have a good one.